Hello and welcome to the first part of the Edwards Virtual Physiology Lab. In this 10 minute presentation, you're going to hear from Dr. Simon Davies from York Teaching Hospitals. He's going to talk about the prevalence of hypotension, the harm associated with hypotension, and then the potential benefits that can be found in predicting that high hypotension. And welcome to the Virtual Physiology Lab. And shortly, we will be looking at a poor sign model of hemorrhage and the associated physiological changes, and also be looking at how we can predict hypotension. And prior to this, this is a sort of 10 minute um, prelude to the lab, focusing on why hypertension is important and look at some new technology that we will encounter in the virtual lab that may help us address the issues of hypertension hypertension. We all know that hypertension is a negative perioperative event and some of the papers that you see here have shown the increasing evidence of the association of intraoperative hypertension and poor patient outcomes, specifically in terms of acute kidney injury and also MINS or myocardial injury after non-cardiac surgery. Although if we look deep into literature, there are other associations with death and other patient outcomes. However, in all these patients, or all these papers rather, there is a consistent message throughout. The lower the blood pressure and the longer blood pressure is low for, then the higher the risk that individual patient. And one of the key points we have to remember in the literature looking at hypertension, when we talk about a duration of hypertension, it's not a single episode. It is the cumulative duration of hypertension over the course of surgery that adds up to cause patient harm. So lower and longer is associated with harm, but what is the threshold below which risk starts to increase? And there have been various definitions uh, that have been suggested as a lower threshold, but currently the cutoff below which harm occurs appears to be at 65 millimeters of mercury for the mean arterial pressure. And once you have spent a time below this, or a cumulative time below this, of greater than 30 minutes, the risk of kidney and cardiac injury starts to increase. This is data from the Cleveland Clinic looking at over 55,000 patients. And as we can see, the risk of cardiac and kidney injury increases at a map of 65, or rather below a map of 65, or a 20% drop from your baseline. And the risk for both uh, parameters appears to be the same. This threshold of 65 millimeters of mercury for mean arterial pressure is reflected in guidance from the Perioperative Quality Improvement Initiative and also in various MIPS or merit-based incentive payments seen in the US, highlighting that this threshold and that hypertension is being increasingly recognized as an avoidable cause of patient harm. And one of the interesting notes to really highlight for this study is that one third of hypertension or hypertensive load was for induction to knife the skin, and that is anesthetic induced or caused hypertension. But for hypertension to be a significant problem worthy of our attention, then it really needs to be prevalent. Now, the instance of hypertension is obviously a definite or a function of the definition. Um, this is some data from a retrospective cohort of around about 15,000 patients undergoing general anesthesia, and they calculated the instance and duration of hypotension. Now, if we look at the relative extremes that intuitively we know aren't good for patients, then it's quite an a eye-opening scenario. If we look at a mean arterial pressure of less than 40% of your baseline, so almost half your baseline blood pressure, about half of patients have that for one minute or so. Uh, and that is understandable, and we can explain that away. Uh, sudden one-off induction, a clump coming off, some positional changes. Um, we can understand this, and that happens and is probably very difficult to avoid. However, 40% of patients have this for five minutes or longer, and that's slightly less easy to, uh, to buy. You know, this is us being a bit slow on the fluid or the vasopressor, being a bit delayed in terms of treatment. But one in four patients or 25% of patients have this for 10 minutes or more. Now, that is not viable. That, to me, is avoidable and untreated hypotension. If we look at other thresholds that we know are associated with patient harm, for example, a map of less than 55, there is no safe duration that a blood pressure could be less than 55 without eliciting some form of increased risk to patients. About a third of patients have that for a minute or so, but once again, we see still significant levels at the 10 minute mark or more. And going back to the Salmassi paper, the data from the Cleveland Clinic, our map threshold of less than 65, we know this is the new target or new threshold we're looking for. And once again, at the 10 minute mark, at least a third of patients have endured that hypotensive burden.
So all these thresholds that we see on this graph here are associated with patient harm, and we can see very significant durations that the patients have to endure this for. So why is hypertension so prevalent? And there are indeed many reasons, uh, partly because of various definitions, partly because we don't measure it very well. But the fundamental problem is that we treat hypertension. So we treat it, we allow it to happen. We live in this state of reactive medicine, where something happens, that something is hypertension, and at some point after that, we react and we treat it. But in the interim, hypertension has happened, and for variable periods of time. But remember, the association of hypertension and harm is due to the cumulative amount of time spent by that threshold. So repeated small times in the hypertension adds up to cause patient harm. But hypertension just doesn't occur. With the exception of a few surgical causes and clamps coming off, etc., there is a state of instability that precedes the actual event that we can't detect with our standard monitoring. If we could detect that instability that would lead to hypertension, we could move to a state of proactive medicine, treating instability before the event actually occurred, and hopefully avoiding hypertension. So maybe the future now is predicting hypertension before it occurs. And there are now algorithms that exist that predict the likelihood of, of hypertension from features from the arterial waveform. Now, the arterial waveform is information rich. Uh, systolic rise time tells us about contractility. Systolic decay time tells us about large vessel compliance. We can estimate stroke volume. We can estimate afterload. All in all, we can extract around about 160 features from one single arterial waveform. And when we combine this with how those features interact, how complex they are and how they vary, that increases to almost 3,000 features. The best predictive features from that undergo a combinatorial permutations. And what we end up is 2.6 million features per arterial waveform. And this all goes into a machine learning algorithm, the output which is 23 features that predict hypotension. And that algorithm is called the hypertension prediction index. And so we end up with that algorithm in a box, and that complex algorithm gives us a number ranging from 1 to 100. And that is what the hypertension prediction index is. Uh, we also get some additional parameters, such as DPDT and EADYNE, and we'll talk about those a bit later on. So this is not a mystery box. It's not a mystery number from a box. It is the output from a complex algorithm derived from millions of features and vast amounts of data points that is used to predict the likelihood of hypotension. So what is HPI then? Well, HPI is a number that relates to the likelihood of trending towards a hypertensive event. Now, the hypertensive event is defined as a mean arterial pressure of less than 65 millimeters of mercury for greater than one minute. And so the higher the number, the higher the likelihood of an event occurring and the shorter the time scale to it happening. The lower the number, the less likely a hypertensive event will occur and the longer, or if it does occur rather, the longer the time to that event. And so in practice, this is what it means. Uh, this is data from our hospital, which was uh, published uh, earlier on this year in anesthesia and analgesia. So remember, HPI is an output from the algorithm ranging from 1 to 100. So if HPI is, say, between 20 and 29, around about a third of patients will be hypertensive moving forward. Initially, this seems rather poor, but as they approach hypertension, the HPI algorithm will increase its number, so it will increase. So about a third of patients will be hypotensive, and the median time to events is around about nine minutes or so. If we take a HPI of 90 to 99, then almost all patients will become hypotensive moving forward, and the time to hypertension is shortened, a median time of around about 2.3 minutes. So the higher the number, the more likely hypertension is to occur, and the shorter the time scale to occurring. The lower the number, the less likely hypertension is to occur, and the longer the time to event. In terms of clinical practice, what does this mean? Well, this is an example from an anterior resection, an uh, open anterior resection done a number of months ago. Uh, the black line is HPI, the red line is our mean arterial pressure. We can see that HPI breaches the threshold of 85. Above 85, HPI will alarm, and this threshold is chosen because of the high positive predictive value. But once that has alarmed or breached the threshold, we don't see hypertension for almost seven minutes later. 
And the whole premise of this predictive technology is that in that interim period, we can investigate the underlying physiology, the cause of impending hypotension, and intervene, hence avoiding that hypotension happening at all. So HPI is a warning. It tells us about impending hypertension, but we don't treat HPI. We treat the underlying physiology that is causing HPI to be raised. But HPI may be more than just that. It's a warning. It's what HPI does is quantify the process or uh, the, the features leading to hypertension, and that is cardiovascular instability, and that is what it's quantifying. So a change in HPI might be just as important as the absolute number alone. And once again, just reiterate, we don't treat the number. We don't treat HPI, we treat the underlying cause of the cardiovascular instability. And finally, before we uh, go into the uh, virtual physiology lab, uh, just a quick mention of some new parameters, and these are explored in more detail in the full-length virtual lab that is available uh, throughout at POM. Uh, there are two new parameters that we'll see in the virtual physiology lab. The first one, which is EA Dyne. Now, EA Dyne, or dynamic arterial elastance, is our pulse pressure variation divided by our stroke volume variation. It's a complex parameter which represents to a degree, ventricular arterial coupling. But clinically, it's a measure of whether a patient who is preload responsive will increase their blood pressure to a fluid bolus. We also have DPDT, so change in pressure over change in time. And this is a measure of the systolic slope of a peripheral arterial waveform. And again, being the maximal pressure uh, change over time, and it's a surrogate of our left ventricular contractility. Now, all these will be explored and more in the upcoming physiology lab and in more full detail in the full length lab available, as I say, throughout our POM. Thank you very much for your time, and I hope you enjoy the lab. <laughs>